Fred Ford called me one day and he wanted somebody to go help him at Florence Darlington Tech. And I went over there in 1963 as associate director. And uh, I was in that job for about three years with at Florence Darlington. And then the opening came down here to uh, come to Georgetown and I applied and uh, I, was, I was appointed in, in G January of 1966. Uh, the changes that I've seen over the time has been not only in the facilities, we've gone from a two building little small campus on 12 acres to a multi-campus, three campus institution. But we have evolved over time into a very complex, sophisticated, high quality institution that, that this state needs to be very proud of, not only of this college, but also of the system itself, which has been emulated by all 50 states. We had a lot of GI veterans uh, that were attending a, lot of, a strong evening program here. So we had students that were in their mid-20s to 60s years old. Uh, they were the working class students, and they were many times uh, those that were coming here to start their career. And O'Ree Georgetown had to really apply three times to get approved. The first two times they were turned down because they did not have the population base. I think O'Ree County at that time had about 60,000 people. Number two, they had to have a certain amount of high school graduates. They didn't have that. And number three was the industrial base or potential. They did not meet any of the criteria. They even had to include Marion at that time to get additional population base and also high school seniors. But still, they did not meet the criteria. For two times and the third time, the uh, state board finally gave them a tentative approval, but it had to prove itself. And we were lucky from the standpoint that Dr. Cathcart Smith of Conway was chairman of the State Board of Education, and he got us some vocational funds to help pay for the building and the rest came from the local sources. At that time, the local sources had to provide the building and half of the maintenance costs. The state would come in and put, equip it, pay half the maintenance costs, and uh, provide the faculty, et cetera. Some of the greatest changes have been the changes with our facilities, the changes in terms of our students' strength to be accepted and transferring into senior institutions and credibility that we have, that the universities yearn to have our students to transfer, how we are well received by business and industry that our students are able to step out of here after they graduate with a degree and they are enhancing the workforce as a result of that. And a great change has come about through technology. What we came to realize is that we could not survive on the typical tech curriculum. So we came up with forestry, hotel motor restaurant management, and golf course management. So all three of those programs really just kind of burgeoned out and made us grow into a full technical education center. These people were kind of like pioneers. You had to be a person who liked to create things and make things happen because it was not a place for somebody looking for a nice place to land. Because our faculty, for example, we would charge them, and you can appreciate this today, we would charge them with helping us to recruit students, also to not only teach them, et cetera, but also help to find jobs for them. In the 70s, late 70s, we had a young man whose father had just passed away, and the state director of the technical college system said he's moving into the Myrtle Beach area and he needs an opportunity. That young man came out here and he started in developmental studies. And he had no skills, no high school strength to come in. And he, so he went through developmental studies math, through developmental studies English, and then he went on to become a civil engineer and he is one of our civil engineers in Myrtle Beach area. I used to make a speech about this, about how it really affects some small people. There are three people that I always use. One was a, a young lady that was about 14 or 15, they dropped out of high school, got married, dropped out of high school, she was divorced at about 17, came back with us and got the uh, secretarial science degree, got a GED first, got a secretarial science program, and then she got a nice secretarial job later on. A, a second person was this, this uh, individual who was a janitor down at one of the motor companies in, in, uh, in Conway. And uh, the owner of the company paid for him to come out at Old Town at night 
to get his training, he got, he got a degree in, in auto mechanics and opened up his own garage. A third one, which is probably is, is one of the most unusual, when we uh, had the uh, special school, the special school for Adrian, that was a new textile mill out there, this individual was 55 years old, had never driven a car before, did not know how to drive. He had to buy him a car and learn to drive so he could go to work. I mean, those are kind of three just good bottom line success stories. How successful our early college high school yeah. was being. The, the, these are young people that are nominated by the guidance counselors in various middle schools that are in that middle quartile of achievement, have little or no family history of anybody ever going beyond high school, uh, usually fairly, uh, pretty deep poverty levels that they pick, but they see something in these kids. that they can put them in the right environment, things can go well. So we take a hundred a year. They come out in the ninth grade and they take basically high school classes in ninth grade. They take a college class in the 10th grade. And by the time they're in their junior year, at least their second mm -hmm. semester, some of them are taking almost all college classes. That thing has grown to this past year, it was rated by the Federal Department of Education as the number one high school in South Carolina. It was picked by U.S. News and World Report as the 204th best high school out of 500 in the nation. And they're predicting now people go to work in 2020 can expect to change jobs between 17 and 18 times in a 40 year job career. 17 to 18 times. If you're going to survive in the world today, you've got to be able to analyze, synthesize, you've got to be able to do math, and you've got to be able to critically think. If you've got that foundation as job changes occur, then you can adapt. And this college will probably be, I mean, they're, they're telling us today that if you, gra if, the, if a individual goes to a senior institution, at the end of their junior year, everything they've learned is obsolete. That's a very difficult environment to work in, and we know that technology is going to expand more and more rapid as we go out into the future. Proud to say that I believe that our college leads in technology in terms of the students having the hands-on applications and the technological advances, but the way our faculty have been able to enhance instruction with technology. Many businesses have said to us, give me somebody that's got 25 to 50% of the technical expertise, but beyond that, I want them to come to work on time. I want them to be able to listen want them to be able to work in a team with other people, want them to be able to focus in, on what the job is, solve problems, uh, get along with people. I don't know if there's anything more important in life than providing opportunities for people to get an education so that they can better themselves and their families. And never forget, it's not just that one person that you're helping. It's all the people that are associated with it you begin to lift up.